So for those who would like to move forward, feel free. For those of you who'd like to move back, <laughs> feel free. Um, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, man, this is really awkward for me. I hate speaking on the stage. I might be physically looking down at you, but I always love being down there because I just want to be with, be with the people. But they've told me that I, this is my place now. So, so here we go. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll welcome the... You guys good in the back? You happy to stay, hang out there? Great. For those uh, who are visiting with us this morning, um, my name's Mark, and grateful to uh, spend some time with you. We're his church. We believe that Jesus is alive. He is our Savior. Uh, we're not singing songs just for the sake of it, but we know that he hears. Uh, and those words we sing, they are life and truth. And uh, so where do we get all of that from? We get that from this, uh, his word, inspired by him, written by men, but life-changing and powerful and has been uh, from, the, from the days it's been written and can change lives today. So how many you write your Bibles with you this morning? Just, yeah, yeah, hold them up. Perfect. This week you do need them. Uh, and so uh, we encourage you to, if you don't have your own um, Bible that you understand, you might have a Bible that's like, oh, we gave it, somebody gave it to us on our wedding, but you open it and it's like, thee, thou, thus, and oh, okay, I'm done. Uh, I would love to just bless you with a Bible, a good one. So just come talk to me after church. I will give you one. We have them specifically for that. Uh, they're designed to help point you to Jesus as you read through. You're like, well, I don't know if I understand. That's okay. We would love for you just to be reading scripture every day and allow, allow him to have the opportunity to speak to you. So this morning as we dig into his word, that is our hope, that you would hear him speak to you. I like how Chris prayed. If Mark is speaking or whoever is speaking, I guess it doesn't matter as long as Holy Spirit is speaking. And that's our, our heart this morning. So we, uh, we want to help people find Christ. That is why we gather together. We want people to know him. It, it, to, and for you here today, maybe you're like, I'm a follower of Jesus. I oh, mean, we want you to know him more, that we might grow in our relationship with him and that we would also find community. And that is, uh, man, that's what we're all about. So grateful to be doing that with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. Before we get there, we are in a new series. We started at the beginning of the year. If you've been here the last three weeks or watched online, you'll be keeping up to speed with us on this series we base on a proverb. It's not a, it's not a proverb from uh, scriptures. It's uh, I had people guessing, was it Mother Teresa who said this? It's some guy named Lao Tso or something. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. But he said this, you give a man, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And uh, as I thought about this months and months ago, I thought about this series and how it's so easy for us to just for me to just give a sermon and say, you know, there you go. And hopefully it helped. And you probably don't remember it the next day, but at least I fed you for a day. We realize that in the culture we live in, that, that's not enough. And it was never enough. We've defaulted to that. But what really his desire is, is that, that as pastors and, and leaders, our job is to equip you to know how to find his daily word for your life every single day. And so Ephesians 4 verse 11 is, is uh, the, you know, I, I'm reading it to me more than you this morning, but it says this, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And I know before I've said, hey, I'm a gift to you. But that's not the point today. <laughs> the, the point is this, their responsibility, my responsibility is to equip God's people. Any God's people here this morning? Any God's people watching online? You can raise your hand. Nobody's looking. All right. You know, uh, my responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. That is what this is all about. And that's why we gather here this morning. So in week one, we learned how to read scripture every day with other people. That was something we challenged, uh, challenged this whole, our whole church to do. And many of you have taken up the challenge and you got on the Bible app and you're reading the New Testament along with some uh, or different, different ones, it's not too late to start. If you're interested in doing it, I had somebody last week said, I, I didn't get the memo, uh, but I feel like I'm behind. I was like, there's no behind. You just start today. It's a great time to start. And if that's you, text me. I will hook you up with some other people. Uh, and uh, you, you don't have to meet them even. It's just you're reading online. You get to chat about things that you're learning. And then last week, how many of you were here last week? And last week, really cool. Jackie was here. And we, went to, we began to learn how to listen for his voice as you read. We realize the biggest thing to do, we got to slow down. We got to slow down. We got to observe. What does it say? What does it really say? As we read through it, we, we, we give ourselves time to do that. And then, second, ask the question what does it mean? 
Not what does it mean to me? What does it mean? And then finally, how do I apply it? Like, what do I do with what I've read? And so uh, those are week one and week two. And week three, uh, we want to look at today's title is how to go fishing for men. Go fishing for men. I would encourage you to take notes. There's some white paper in front of you. There's pens in every little pocket. Just a side note, those pockets are for holding stuff other than garbage. So please, I know I, I was going through there yesterday. I'm like, man, everybody thinks they have their own personal dumpster in front of them. That is, that is not, do you know how difficult it is to put those papers in when there's like little Kleenexes and suckers? And I like, there's crazy stuff in there. You can even check. It's probably still there. But grab that paper, grab a pen, use the back of it for now. I know you see some go fishing on the front or whatever. Use the back, jot down some of these scriptures. But if you've been reading in the New Testament, all good? Sharon's, Sharon's on it. All right. If you've been reading along uh, in the New Testament with us over the past uh, number of weeks, you would have recently read this scripture that we're about to, to look at. But in Matthew chapter 4, are you there with us? Here the page is turning. We're getting there. Matthew 4, verse 18. I'm going to read this in the New King James this morning. It says this, And Jesus, um, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. So as we slow down for a minute, can you just picture that? Where's Jesus. Yeah, there you go. He's walking on the beach. Jesus is going for a stroll on the beach, and he sees two brothers. Can you picture it? He sees two guys, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, just in case you didn't realize that two brothers, they were brothers. <laughs> Casting a net into the sea, he says, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, then he said to them, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You guys know how to catch fish, but you know how to catch men. I thought, what does Jesus mean by that? You know, a few years ago, I remember going fishing. Uh, this is the easy, the easy ones. I remember fishing up north with uh, uh, my brother-in-law, Ronnie, and uh, Bob. Bob seems to end up in all of these. I don't know how. He just, he was just there. But, uh, you know, in the early years when we went fishing, it was like two people in a boat. But that year, we had just too many people, not enough boats. And so we had to have three guys in the boat that day, which is never, never great. Uh, and so Ronnie, being the new guy, got the front of the boat. That's prime fishing spot. Me, I got put in the middle, uh, which is probably the worst part. And Bob was directing us to where all the good fish were going to be. And so as we were, as we were uh, moving out into the lake, going to that perfect spot, uh, I, I knew that you know, from years previous that as you approach the spot, the best thing is when you're within range, you cast out because Bob will cast right after and he'll catch, he'll catch stuff. You've got to get there first. And so as we were getting to the spot, I realized, yeah, we're getting there, and I, I know that there's nothing off the side of the boat. i got to cast off the front of the boat. So I was like stood up, and I cast uh, over the front because I was going to beat Ronnie to the good spot. And then all of a sudden, I realized I cast way too hard, and we were way too close to shore. My lure's flying straight into a tree, and as I see it just about to hit, I just pull back really fast. And that lure came flying at me. And I was just so grateful that Ronnie was there to take the hit for me. <laughs> That lure went right into his right bicep, hook, barb, and all. And I'm like, I got one. And I start reeling, right? <laughs> I just want to make sure the line doesn't get stuck in the trees as well. And, and Ronnie's yelling, what are you doing? And Bob's yelling, don't reel it in, don't reel it in. I got, I got a big one. But I don't think that's what Jesus meant when he was talking about fishing for men. You know, and then I was like, as I was preparing for this, I saw that, you, you know, if you Google it, how to fish for men, weird stuff comes up. Um, <laughs> TikTok has a number of influencers. I'm not, I'm not on TikTok. I don't think anybody should be, uh, just saying. But uh, I saw that there's these, this advice that they give, these girls give, how to catch a guy. How, how to, they basically advertise how to get any guy you want in 60 seconds uh, with these quick little psychological tricks. And then they go through these things of just glance, look, whatever. And I was like, I'm sure that's not what, uh, that Jesus was not talking about that way of catching a guy. What is he talking about when he's saying we're fishing for men? And Jesus was simply saying, I want to teach you how to invite people into the, my kingdom. I want to teach you how to invite people to come and follow me. I want to, you to, t to be able to teach people how to come to eternal life, to a different life, to a changed life. I thought, man, that's a pretty important thing. And as I was talking, I met, I met a guy uh, in Hamilton um, this week, his name is Solomon, and he, uh, he travels around to churches and encourages them on evangelism and how to help people share their faith. And he says, as we were chatting, he says, you know, he says, you know that the Barner Research Group and their studies that they've done, they, they, would, they would determine that about 90% of Christians have never shared their faith with anyone? 90%? I was like, wow, that seems like Seems way too high. So I went and checked on the Barna research, and I found study after study after study, and I couldn't find exactly where this 90% was. But what I saw is, you know, 
uh, 15 years ago when they studied, it was this percent. And then as uh, uh, 10 years ago, it was lower. And, and the trend is getting lower and lower. And they said there's different reasons for that. Some think that it's because the, you know, they feel like the church, that's the church's job to share the gospel or you know, famous preachers or YouTube and whatever else. It's not, it's not my job as a, just as a believer. And so I thought, man, that's crazy. But before we blame them for not doing it, just poll here in the audience. You don't have to raise your hand. But just think about this. How many of you have shared your faith with somebody else? How many of you have shared the gospel with another person? If you call yourself a Christian, you say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Have you shared your faith? Or you say, oh, man, I'm actually helping the 90%. You know, I believe in this building, actually, if we did show of hands, we're probably turning the curve the other way. We're turning the curve the other way. But I think there's still that truth that there's many who would say I'm a Christian have never shared the gospel, shared their faith with anybody. And today we want to take a look at that. Why don't they do it? For some, here, here's what I think. For some, there's people who don't share their faith with others because when it comes down to it, they actually don't have a faith in Christ. They come to church. This is a regular routine for them. But when they get challenged to say, why are you a, are you a follower of Jesus and why? They're like, oh, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know how to answer that. And if that's you this morning, I'm glad you're here because I'd love to speak to you about that. And the second group of people, I think, is in the same spot. They're like, yeah, I, I, I've put my faith in Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus. I know he's real. I know what he's done in my life. I just don't feel like I have the right words to say. And I would love to speak with you about that as well. So, you know, as I think about how Jesus, how did he teach people to fish for men? How did he teach people to invite them into this new life of following him? We actually find out that he was teaching these fellows on the beach. He was teaching them in that moment of how he invited them. It was actually what he was, he was teaching them how to invite others as well. So today I could come up, man, today would have been the easiest day to come up with a sermon of fishing analogies. You want to fish for men? You got to go where the fish are. You know, you got to go to places where there's people. You know, you got to keep a line in the water. You should probably wear a Christian fish on your t-shirt so people ask questions and then there's your line in the water, right? You've got to have the right bait and then you switch it to be about Jesus after. Uh, we could go through all that. But I think it's deeper than that. I think it's, it's, it's not just a, hey, here's a clever uh, worded message, but more so that there's something that happens in each and every heart this morning. So let's go take a look back at that, this account we just read about how Jesus called these first followers. Matthew 4, verse 18, still there? It says this, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Then 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. What did he say? He probably said the same thing. Hey, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Anybody read this story this, in the past couple of weeks? Show of hands. Who's, who just read, read this story? I know I saw lots of people have read it. Some have been making comments about this. And as we... Um, as you read this, some, some of the comments that were made is like, man, like they just immediately, Jesus said, follow me. And they immediately left everything and they just followed him. They didn't know who he was, didn't know where he was going. It was just like this blind faith. And that's, that's kind of how evangelism should happen. And there's many people who evangelize that way. They go knock on a door. Hey, I know you don't know me, but there's this guy named Jesus. I think you should follow him before he slammed the door in my face. <laughs> right? How many people have ever, like, how many of you, that was your experience? Somebody knocked on your door. They said, hey, I think you should come follow this guy. And you were like, yes, let's go right now. I knew it. None of you. And yet we read this and we think, wow, these, these guys, they just, they just like, Jesus came and said, come follow me. And they're like, see ya. Like, think about that. Here's Jesus walking down the beach. There's James and John in the boat with their dad. And Jesus, he says, hey, come follow me and I'll teach you how to fish for men. And I'm like, dad, some strange guy just told us to come fish for men with him. We don't know where he's going, but see you, Dad. You're on your own. We'll say goodbye to the family business, goodbye to the family, goodbye to our future. We're going with him. We don't know where he's going. We look at that and we think, man, these are the most unintelligent people ever. And they're the ones who wrote this? I'd be like, man, I, like, and maybe you're here and that's you. You're kind of skeptical of all this. You're like, I, 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 I can't do this blind faith thing. The good news is Jesus isn't asking you to do blind faith. You know, last week, Jackie, as she was here, she talked about how we can use scripture 
to interpret or bring clarity to Scripture. And we're going to do that this morning. So if, if you could just turn towards the right, you'll find the, the uh, account um, from Luke. Luke, who was also a guy who wanted to make sure we had all of the details. You know, Luke also explains this story of how these men came to follow Jesus. And if, if this was a movie... You know, when you watch a movie and you see the first, you know, the opening parts, and then all of a sudden there's these words on the screen that said, three months earlier, dot, dot, dot. That's what's happening right now. Luke is like, if we read Matthew's account, and then the movie was being told from Luke's perspective, he's like, three months earlier, a number of weeks earlier, dot, dot, dot. Um, Jesus, just so he can set, the, set the, um, uh, the stage, Jesus had been preaching everywhere. People were getting healed wherever he was. It was like this, there was this buzz around this Jesus character. And he would go and speak in synagogues, which were Jewish buildings uh, where people would gather to hear the scriptures read. So similar to this a building, but in a Jewish context and that all they would read is the Old Testament. And so um, Jesus is, is speaking in these synagogues and he happens to have this really great message. Lots of good things happen. And then this happens, verse 38. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home. Simon is also the same name as Peter. He says, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. So standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. So Jesus is going home to Simon's house for for lunch after church. And uh, then the worst thing happens. You ever been invited people over for church and then you get home and you're like, oh snap, we don't have anything to feed them. This is Peter. He's like, I invited Jesus over and mom's sick. Like, who's going to bake the dinner? Jesus, please heal her. (laughs) We we need lunch, right? And Jesus heals her. And verse 40, it says this, as the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. Why did they wait? They weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath. They weren't allowed to carry their sick friends to Jesus until the sun went down. So when the sun went down, Jesus is most likely still with Peter, maybe even at his house still. Um, people begin to bring their sick family members to Jesus. And no matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed every one. Many were possessed by demons, and the demons came out of his command, shouting, you're the son of God! And he, because they knew who he was, and that he was the Messiah, he rebuked them and refused to let them speak. Can you picture this? You know, by candlelight, all these people are coming to man. They're just watching these amazing things happen right in front of their eyes. Verse 42, early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place, and the crowd searched everywhere for him. When they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that's why I was sent. So he continued to travel around, preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. They gathered in synagogues on Saturdays. So when he says preaching in synagogues, plural, there's plural weeks that have happened here. Go on to chapter 5. In the original, there is no chapter. It's just one story. It says this, So one day, after these number of weeks, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Hey, now go out to where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. (laughs) Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night. We didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And so this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. And a shout for help brought their partners. Who are their partners? We'll find out in a minute. He says, we brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized, remember that, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please, say, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, oh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And then Jesus replied to Simon, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. From now on, I'll make you a fisher of men. Verse 11, as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Aren't you glad Luke gave us a little bit of the other details? Doesn't that make a whole lot more sense? Here's Jesus, hangs out with Simon for lunch, has a a chance to chat with him. Simon gets to see, or Peter gets to see what happens in a whole bunch of other people's lives. As he's sitting there with Jesus, like, Wow, my mother-in-law just got healed. All these people just got healed. That guy had a demon. Who knew? And now he doesn't. You know, it's like he sees all this happen. And he's pondering this for a few weeks. 
And then he's out at work, and here comes Jesus one more time. He's like, oh, there's that Jesus guy. And Jesus is like, hey, I, there's too many crowds here. Simon, hey, can we, can we use your boat? Oh, yeah, sure, Jesus. Yeah, no problem. And so he paddles out a little ways. And, and what does it say? Jesus is teaching the crowds. Well, where's Simon? He's right there. And what's Jesus teaching? He's teaching about the kingdom. He's teaching about people. Come follow me. Come find life in me. And Simon's like hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. And then Jesus says to Simon, he's like, hey, want to go fishing? He's like, no, I was fishing all night. I didn't catch anything. That's a bad fishing trip. Uh, and just in case, Jesus, in case you don't know, I'm, I know you're good at all that other stuff, but you're not a fisherman uh, because we don't catch fish during the day. And Jesus is like, just trust me. Let's just go do this. And he's like, all right. So they'll go. He's like, because you said it, Jesus, because you, you're somebody I look up to already. You're somebody I admire. I don't, I don't know who you are, but you do incredible things. I'm, yeah, go ahead. Let, let's go. And they throw the net. And I don't think Simon really is like exuberant. He's probably just chucks it off the edge like... <laughs> I know I'm not, I, I just washed these nets. I don't want to have to do that again, but here we go. And all of a sudden, like massive amounts of fish. And he calls his buddies, James, James, John, get the boat over here. Andrew, start pulling them in. And they pull all these fish into the boat. And then he realizes something. What does he realize? I'm not in the presence of just an ordinary man. Who is he? And it dawns on him who he's with, who he's in the presence of. And you know what his response is? If he's God, I'm not. If he's perfect, I'm not. What do you want with me? I realize I'm a sinner. We, we don't belong together. And he says, Jesus, go away from me. Because that is the natural response. And what happens? Jesus said, Peter, Peter, <laughs> you don't got to be afraid. Like, I'm not disqualifying you because you know you're a sinner. That's the reason I came. I'm actually inviting you to come out of that life, come follow me. You in? Peter's like, heck yes I am. <laughs> Boat, doesn't matter. <laughs> I can have Jesus. My old life and all the things I used to love to do, doesn't matter, because I can have Jesus. You know, I hear so often so many Christians like, oh, you know, to follow Christ, it costs so much. You have no idea who he is. Because none of that matters when you have the chance to follow Christ. Because it, you realize, oh man, I need him. It's not just, oh, I just want him in my life. I need him. They left everything and followed him. And you know, as they followed him, he taught them how to fish for men. A few years later, he actually told them, hey, I'm done teaching you. I'm going, I'm leaving, I'm going to heaven. I want you guys to go, go fishing. You guys go fishing for others. Matthew 28, verse 18. Actually, Matthew ends his letter uh, with, with these words. If you want to flip over there, Matthew 28 to the right, verse 18 says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. You go fishing and, 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 and bring others to follow me. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teach these new disciples. Invite them and then train them just like I've done for you to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Simon Peter is one of those guys, and he went out, and he reached all kinds of people, and later he would write a letter to them and say to the new believers, he says, hey, let, let me tell you what I learned, and he says this in 1 Peter 3.15, he says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, and if someone asks about your hope as a believer, if someone asks, hey, why are you following Christ, why do you believe in Jesus, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. And so my question today is this. And if you flip your little sheet over, you'll see the question on the front of that page. Do you have a hope in Jesus? Do you have a genuine hope in Christ today? Do you have a real faith in him? Do you really trust him with your life? Because Peter realized, I can't share something that I don't have. And what we know is Peter is saying, hey, hey, all of you, be ready to share. If you get the opportunity, be ready. You, you may not know when it's going to happen, but be ready. And my question to you is this, are you ready to share your story? Are you ready to share the good news with somebody if they asked? Last week, Brian came and he was chatting with me right before the service. And he said, this, this, he was like, this stuff happened, this stuff happened. I was like, Brian, would you be willing to share that next week? Because it's exactly what we're talking about. I would love for you to hear this story this morning. So Brian, why don't you come on up and share that with us this morning? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so <clears throat> just a couple nights ago, I was reading this scripture from Acts, and I've, I need to share this with you before I share this testimony with you, if I could. And it was Paul writing, and he says, but my life is worth nothing unless is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about God's wonderful kindness and love. So this was this was the Lord had spoken this to Paul. And this was his passion. And you know, I can relate to this. This is my passion. I want to tell others about the good and good kind, the awesome kindness, the wonderful kindness, and the wonderful love that God has showed me and given me. And you know, how many of us have had something great experience happen to you in your life, and you you want to tell so many others? Well, that's what I love doing. And I look for opportunities to share God's love and share the testimony of Jesus. Anyways, this uh, past Christmas, um, my granddaughter Jasmine invited a friend who is from Germany. His name is Paris, and she, he used to go to school here. And he just recently went over to Germany. Well, he came back and spent the Christmas holidays and New Year's with our family. And we had many... Christmas dinners like you all did. And Debbie said to me, my wife, she said to me, Brian, I believe the Lord is drawing Paris. And I said, yeah, I believe so too. So we began to pray. Pray for his salvation. Pray that the Holy Spirit would lead him and give us the opportunity to share his love. So sure enough, I, I needed some stuff done. We're having a fish fry and New Year's. I had to get all this stuff down and Turkey Point, and, and uh, I called him up. I said, Paris, can you come and help me with this stuff? So he came down, and we started working together, and I started sharing with him what the Lord's been doing in my life. And I also shared with him how I first came to know Jesus and how someone had shared the love of God with me. And I said, you know, I, when I asked Jesus into my heart, I said, Lord, I want you, I'd ask you to come and show me you're real. And I said, from that day on, I could see God working in my life each day. I could see his love. And it was <clears throat> the hand of God. And it was so special. And I said to Paris, I said, Paris, would you like to experience this? Would you like to become a son of God? And he looked at me and he said, yes, I would. But how do I do that? Okay. I says, well, we're going to pray together. I'll, you can, I'll pray and you just repeat after me. And so I thanked, I thanked the Lord Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. And I, I said, Lord Jesus, I, I ask that you come into my heart and, and make yourself real to me. And he repeated after me. And then there was silence, and I could look. I looked at him, and he had tears in his eyes. And then he grabbed me and hugged me and hugged me because it was, it was so real. So um, anyways, we um, continued on that day doing our work together, and I shared other things that the Lord had done in my life. And, uh, and then we yeah, finished the work, and I took him back home. So I called Mark. I said, Mark, Mark, where do I buy a Bible? I said, all the Christian bookstores are closed around here. Where do you buy a Bible? So he says, well, here's a good Bible on Amazon. So <laughs> the next day, this Bible came in from Amazon. And uh, so Debbie and I, we, we prayed, we continued to pray for him. And, Anyways, I invited, we invited him over to our house, and we sat him down at the table, and we said, here's your new Bible, Paris. But, you know, I just didn't want to just give him a Bible. You know, what do you what do, you do with this, eh? So we, we showed him, you know, 
what the Old Testament, the New Testament, we showed them the concordance. If you have any questions of any, any words that you want to look for, this, this is how you find words and other words in different scriptures through the Bible. And we, we just shared with Debbie, shared with him uh, how the Lord spoke to her in her life. And I, I shared with him that when I read the Word of God, I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open up the Word, make it real. You never read the Word and it's like, mm, there's nothing there, you know? It's just words. Well, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, the words just jump off the paper and it's just like, becomes real. So that's what he, anyways, I left him with that. We left him with that and the next day I called him up and he shared with me how the Lord spoke to him through, he was reading the Word in the New Testament and how the Lord spoke to him. And it, it was just a really exciting. Anyways, Paris has gone back to Germany and uh, we're continually praying for him and, and uh, but it's, I just wanna share this with you that we all can have these opportunities and I was blessed in, in leading him to the Lord. And I just want to encourage you, it is real special to lead others to the Lord, the Lord's love. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. There's parishes everywhere. They really are. Uh, what I love about this um, Brian's story is just that he was prepared ahead of time. He's like, I know how to share what, what Jesus did in my life. I know where to, um, how to share the gospel, the good news uh, for his life. And uh, that's what we see. That's what we see when we look at scripture, um, when we see these guys like Peter and James and John and how they went on through the book of Acts. They were ready and prepared and used to telling their story. Think about this for a second. How did Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three guys, not named Peter, know Peter's story in order to write it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? How do you think they knew Peter's story of his conversion? They weren't on the beach. How do they know? He told them. Peter would have told his story often. Paul, as you read through Acts, you can even read Paul's conversion story. He's like, I was riding on a horse to Damascus, and I saw a bright light, and I hit the ground, and I heard the Lord's voice speak to me. He shares it throughout there. He shares it throughout his writings. Why? Because he's like, I know what happened to me, and I know how to share that with other people. My question for you this morning is, how about you? If you look at that second part on your sheet, do you know how Jesus reached you? Have you thought about that? I know you, you know that it's happened in your life, but have you thought about the details? And I'm like, it's a small little area. You can't write everything there. But maybe you think about who was there and where did it happen and how did I know? I remember growing up in a Christian home and I was like, you know, I was a good little boy. I was a firstborn and a Christian and a Canadian and tried to do all the good things. I, uh, I didn't drink. I never smoked, I never tried drugs, I never kissed a girl, I thought it was by choice, it might not have been, but I never, I never, like I never did any of these things that, that people would say were bad. And yet, there was this day in it when I was working in a greenhouse where it all kind of came uh, to a clear, clarity for me that I, I was not good in the eyes of God. It didn't matter what I thought, it didn't matter what anybody else thought. I knew that there was sin here. I knew I was broken. I knew I needed a savior. And I remember what happened in, in that moment where I just gave my life to Christ. I was like, I, I understood what I was doing. And man, I, I pray that for you, but are you prepared to share? And then finally, they were ready, prepared, and used to sharing the gospel. The gospel, the good news. What do we tell them? And I'm gonna ask our ushers, we're gonna celebrate communion together this morning. I know it's a little, uh, it may not be in our same time frame. It doesn't matter. It, the importance is what we're doing here this morning. So if our ushers can uh, hand out the emblems of communion, I think it would be great. Uh, and if you're watching online, maybe just push pause. Go uh, grab some emblems of communion. If you don't have, you know, uh, wine and bread, grab, you know, grape juice and, and I don't know, what are those crackers? Goldfish crackers. It's, it's all good. It's what, it's what it signifies. Well, here's what Paul wrote. And if you have your paper in front of you, just write this verse down. Write 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 6. In that, second, that, that last part, how do, do I know how to share the gospel? Just jot it that down there. And I hope as you take it home, you have a chance to read these words from Paul who said this, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you, 
Let me tell you what I actually shared with you in the beginning. He says, you welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. And it's this good news that saves you. Because there's lots of good news out there. Recently, I got an email that I have a long-lost Nigerian prince who's related to me that I had no idea. He's sending me all of his wealth. That is good news. Why are you laughing? You'll be sorry when I drive in here in a Tesla. It, it, it's good news. Sorry. In a Lambo, we have a Tesla. We have, a, we have a young, another young fellow here who also has a Nigerian prince related to him. <laughs> what was my point? Good news. There's lots of good news that actually doesn't save you. And Paul's saying there's all kinds of good news, you know? You're pregnant. There's good news. You won a million dollars. There's good news. You know, you passed your physical, whatever. But the good news that saves you, there's only one. He says it's this good news. It's not like do good works and try and impress God. That's not good news. It's not go to church regularly and, and you know, you'll, you'll get in by the skin of your teeth. That's not good news. He says, this is the good news and, and don't miss it. He says, it's this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. But here's what he says, verse 3. I passed on to you what was most important and what's been passed on to me. Number one, that Christ died for our sins. He says our because he's like, I, I have them too. You and I, every one of us, Christ died for our sin. We don't like to think of ourselves as sinners, but we need to. We need to think about the fact that this perfect world that God created, we're part of the brokenness in it now. That that's us. And that he hung on a cross because of me, for my sin. That's why he hung there. Just as scripture said, verse 4, he says he was buried because he died there. This wasn't some like, you know, some early, uh, you know, magic trick where Jesus found a way to disappear off the cross. And, and everybody's like, oh, wow, what a trick. No, he died. Literally dead. We say it dead, dead. And then buried for three days. And it says then he was raised from the dead. This all happened. And he says, how do we know? Because he was seen. People saw him. Peter saw him. Peter, the same Peter we're talking about, he saw him risen from the dead. And he says there's up to 500 people who saw him at one time. And why does Paul write this? He's like, because you can go and ask them. He's like, fact check me. Go, go to Israel and find these, go to Jerusalem, find these 500. Uh, they'll tell you what we saw. We're not making up a story. We saw something. And that's the power of the good news is that those words today, they're real for you here this morning. I could do show of hands. Anybody have sin in their life? <laughs> I don't need to. Every hand would be up. We all know it. We all know there's these things that we have not lived perfect life, but the gospel is that Christ died for my sin. Why does it matter? Because there's judgment for sin. You know, when you speed and you get caught and you have to pay a ticket, what's the judgment? $300, depending on how fast you were going. But it's a weight. It could be up to 10000 if you were going too fast. It's a weight and that same thing, it says every single one of our sin has a judgment weight attached to it. Not because God's angry, because he's just. And if we think about every sin, if we think back into our past, weight after weight after weight after weight, it will crush us. It will crush us, and it's not because of him, it's because of us. Man, we need somebody to rescue us. And we realize it's not something that we can do on our own. It's not something we can do on our own. We need help. We need help, and... You know, one of the ways that these believers would remind themselves of the gospel was what we're about to do. They would celebrate communion and they would remember what Christ did for them. But as we go to that, let me ask you this question. What do you do with something that's broken beyond your ability to repair it? What do you do if you've got something that's broken and you don't have the ability to repair it? You have two options. One, you can chuck it. Or two, you can put it in the hands of a professional and see if they can fix it. Like when I was a kid and I got my tooth knocked out, I remember taking it to the dentist because I couldn't know, I didn't know how to put it back in. <laughs> he didn't either, but he put a fake one in. He knew how to fix it. I remember breaking my, my leg and I was like, I can't fix this. And going to the doctor and having them fix it. I remember cutting the pinky, tip of my pinky finger off and carrying it into the hospital and be like, 
I can't, I know, I'm danger, uh, accident prone. Um, that's why I don't like it up here. But, uh, but I remember handing it to, to the doctor, and they're like, oh, uh, but we, we know what to do with that. And they put it back on. But my, my question is, what do you do with a broken life? Whose hands can you put that in? No one here. And that's why, as we sang about his nail-scarred hands, his broken hands were broken for me that I might be made whole. His blood was shed that my sinfulness might be washed away, and there was only one who could do it. And you know how we know it? Because Jesus, the very one who died and rose from the dead, who conquered all, said these words in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. He broke that bread in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. He wasn't saying this bread is my body, like specifically he's saying this bread, this broken, he says this is what's going to happen. My body's going to be broken for you and take and eat it. Verse 27, he took a cup of wine, he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Again, he's not saying this is my blood in this cup. Do I, oh, thanks. I'm guessing that's for me. Thank you. He's not saying that, the, that this stuff in this cup miraculously changes to his blood. That's not what he's saying to them. He's saying, hey, my blood's going to be shed for the forgiveness of your sin. Can you picture that? Sitting around that table, Peter, <laughs> Peter, here's my, here's my broken body. It's for you. And Peter, this is, this is my blood for your forgiveness. And Peter and the fellows are like, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. They have no idea what's about to happen. The very next day, they go out and they watch it happen literally in front of them. They watch their best friend's body broken by Roman whips, hung up on a cross, his blood dripping out until he dies, running down that cross and on the ground. And they're like, what, what happened? What just happened? They have no idea. Till three days later, they see him alive and they realize, oh, he just did what he said he was going to do. His body was broken so mine wouldn't have to be. Peter would later write, it was by his stripes that I am healed. His broken body was for my healing. And as, as Jesus, if he was here this, today physically, he would hand this to each and every one of you and say, Mona, this is my body broken for you. Shelton, Nevea, Becky, Kevin, Nico, Jerusha, this is my body. It's broken for you. Life-changing power. If we would believe and trust that what he did there changes our lives today. <laughs> we say goodbye to the old, hello to him. He, he does something incredible. I'm grateful, you. Yes. Let's take that together. Jesus, we do this in remembrance of you. We slow down right now and we think about what you did on that cross for us. The pain you endured, that you were broken in our place. God, thank you for rescuing us broken people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He says, after dinner, he took a cup. Those guys were familiar that blood had to be shed for sin to be forgiven. And Jesus said, you know what, I'm going to do it once and for all. No matter how many sins you have, I'll wash them all away. <laughs> That's incredibly good news. And so this morning, he says it to each of us, every single one of us that may have sin in our past or that we were born sinners, we were born broken. He's like, hey, if you want it all washed away, there's only one way. It is putting your trust in me. It is putting your trust in me. You know that song, Chris referenced it, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes me white as snow. So no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today, it's in this cup, it's just grape juice. It represents that, though. As we take it, it's the same thing as taking it by faith, saying, Jesus, I trust you. As you're inside of me, you've washed me clean from the inside out. Man, that is good news. Let's take it. Jesus, thank you that your blood is enough. Enough for me, enough for every person in this room, enough for this whole world. 
Lord, thank you for making us aware of our need for you this morning. And Jesus, thank you for the answer that we have in you. Lord, for us, those of us who know you, we are grateful for what you've done. God, we press on to know you even more, to live out our lives in response to the sacrifice you've made for us. May you be glorified. And Father, I pray for those this morning who don't know you as they experience this moment together. Father, maybe they, like Peter, just realized, just realized today who you are. Lord, as they surrender their lives to you, as they say yes to you, would you lead them by your spirit? Would you fill them? Would you wash them clean? Would you lift that weight off their shoulders? And would you give them new life? Would you make them alive again? God, I thank you that you're the only one who can do it. And we believe for that to happen in and through your church. Father, I pray for your church as they go out this week, as they prepare to share their story, as they study your word to know the good news to share with others. May we see many, many, many more come to know you as a result. And may you be glorified as only you deserve. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I would encourage you to take that paper with you. Would you just take one day, one little, one moment of time this week and just sit down with it and just think through those things. Normally we have questions up on the screen that are discussion questions for groups. This isn't one of those times. We want you to ask these questions, but would you ask them individually? And then uh, fill those things in and think about that. And uh, as well, I don't know if we announced it, but we are having baptism services over the next three weekends. Oh, yeah, and there are people every weekend getting baptized. But if you're interested in joining us and you want to be baptized, please come talk to me. Even if you just have questions about it, I would love to chat with you more about it. Take your cups to the back and toss them in the garbage, not in the pocket. And uh, please go get your children. Have a fantastic week. And if you see Paris is out there... Man, I pray you're ready. Have a great one. You'll be sorry when I drive in here in a Tesla. <laughs>